Hello, and welcome to Engineering Ethics at NJIT. I'm Daniel Estrada, your instructor, and this will be the lecture video for Lesson 2, The Scope of Ethical Consideration. Let's go ahead and jump into the lesson. All right, so this is Lesson 2. The theme for this lesson is the scope of ethical consideration. Uh, and this, in this lecture video, I'll want to introduce the theme, um, and I want to just say a few words about the readings. There's quite a lot of readings this lesson, so I want to just introduce you to the readings to help you get going to uh, give you some introduction to what's going on in this lesson. Um, I'll be using the Prezi uh, to go through most of this material. So let me jump into the Prezi here. All right. So lesson two, the scope of ethical consideration. I'll go ahead and just say right off the bat that your secret word for this lesson is scope. Uh, you can get that out of the way first. So if you put scope into the, your lecture, secret word, you should get attendance credit for this lecture. As I said, the theme for this lesson is the scope of ethical consideration. Um, what is the scope of ethics? What should it be? What is the scope of ethics in engineering? Um, another way of asking this question is, you know, what issues, what perspectives get included in our discussion of ethics and values? And which issues and values and perspectives are excluded? Right? What uh, values are considered important and what values are neglected or ignored? Um, what gets brought into the discussion? and what uh, is left out of the discussion. And this is what I mean by scope. What is the range? Um, what, what is the range that is included and what is the range that is excluded? By what methods do we determine what is included and what is excluded in our ethical considerations? Right. Should there be anything that's is just excluded from our considerations? Um, should there be any anyone or anything that's excluded from our considerations? Do some values matter more than others? Do some perspectives matter more than others? Wh whose perspectives matter more than others? Should they matter more than others? Right, these are uh, ethical questions that sort of uh, touch on the issue of scope. Right, um, just to be absolutely clear, when I'm using the word scope, I'm meaning it in this first definition, in the sense of this first definition. Uh, the extent of the area or subject matter that something deals with or to which it's relevant. Um, the scope here is just the range of the issue and what's included and what's excluded from that range. Um, it might be helpful to think about this in, uh, Venn diagram, in terms of Venn diagrams. So in a Venn diagram you have a universe of discourse and then the circles in a Venn diagram uh, 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 s describe or visualize certain categories and then uh, things fit into those categories or don't. Right? So the universe of discourse here are the animals, so all these things are animals. Some of these animals can swim, uh, right? the jellyfish and the ducks and uh, the water moccasins can swim. Uh, some of these can breathe air, some of those have legs, some have fins. And uh, what you see in this Venn diagram are how all these animals relate to these categories. And in some of these categories, the animals are included and some of them are not. They're not right? So uh, Chimpanzees both breathe air and have legs, but they can't swim. Sea turtles breathe air, can swim, and have legs. Um, so Venn diagrams are a way of visualizing the relationship between these objects and their various categories, and how these categories overlap and intersect. And this is one way of thinking about the scope, right? So the scope of can swim are all the animals that fit into this uh, circle, and that scope is different from the scope of animals that can breathe air and so on. And the way that these things overlap I uh, can tell you a lot about these different animals. Um, here's another Venn diagram that does the same thing. Uh, robots, zombies, aliens. Robots and zombies both have no emotions. Zombies and aliens both have a taste for flesh. Aliens and robots both have advanced technology. And all three uh, have an interest in killing all humans. Um, right, so these are different, you might think, interest groups. They have different interests. Those interests overlap with the interest groups of others uh, in various ways. Um, and uh, the scope of their interests gives them certain um, alliances and maybe tensions or conflicts within these groups. Uh, the point here is just to think about the scope of ethical consideration in very general, even formal terms. Right? This is a sort of formal feature of our ethical discussions, the scope. Um, and the readings are designed to get you to think about the scope of ethics in uh, different ways. So the first reading, the first of the required readings I have you do is to look at the NSPE Code of Ethics. Um, this is in the appendix in the back of your book. 
Um, the NSP Code of Ethics, uh, NSP is the National Society of Professional Engineers, and they have an official code of ethics uh, for a anyone who's a member of this national society. It's a professional society. Um, different engineering professions uh, might have different national societies and slightly different codes of ethics. In fact, you'll see all those different codes of ethics uh, in the back of your book. Um, the NSP is the sort of canonical excuse me, is the sort of canonical one uh, that we'll be using uh, for most of our discussion. We'll go through the Code of Ethics from the NSPE uh, line by line later on in the semester uh, to see exactly what's going on. The thing I want to draw your attention to here is the fundamental canons, which starts off the Code of Ethics. The canons are the basic principles on which the rest of the, um, the Code of Ethics lies. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to this first canon, the first principle, the most important principle, of the Code of Ethics. Um, the first canon says, engineers in their fulfillment of their professional duties shall hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Hold paramount, hold it as the utmost uh, importance, of the utmost importance. Uh, this is the principle that uh, guides all, all the other principles. Right, so hold paramount. What do you hold paramount? Well, the health, safety, the safety, health, and welfare of the public. And this canon immediately raises a question of scope. Namely, who counts as part of the public? And for that matter, um, who says what counts as the safety, health, and welfare of that group? Right, but uh, maybe before we get too complicated, just who counts as the public? Right, who counts as part of the discussion of the public? And how does that group differ from other groups that might be interested in an engineering project? Right, so uh, the NSPE says that engineers shall hold as their utmost concern the health, safety, welfare of the public. But other groups might have uh, interests that conflict with or uh, otherwise uh, go against the health, safety, welfare of the public. Maybe they have interests that put the public at risk, uh, put the safety of the public at risk, um, or represent a danger to the public. Right? And how do those groups differ from uh, uh, how, do the, how do the interests of those groups differ from the interests of the public? Should the public always be our primary interest as engineers? Should the safety of the public be our primary concern? Or are there other groups that might uh, be more concerned? For instance, uh, consumers. You know, maybe a consumer wants a device and they're willing to pay for a device that represents a threat to the health, safety, and welfare of the public, right? So where do your obligations lie? To the consumers or to the public? Well, the National Code of Ethics thinks that it's the public that matters more. The consumers are members of the public, but so are other people, right? And the, maybe the consumer interests are not the interests that should be uh, decisive. The National Society of Professional Engineers thinks that the, pub, the health, safety, and welfare of the public should be the decisive interest in any engineering project. But is it the public that should always be the primary concern for engineers? Um, if not, what might the exceptions be? Should other interests override the public concern? Are there broader groups, interest groups? Are there broader scopes of ethical consideration that range beyond the public? Right? Is the public maybe too narrow of a group? Um, or maybe there are other interests to consider uh, beyond just the public. Uh, why or why not? Right. Um, there's no right or wrong answer to these questions. These are just trying to get you to think about uh, the scope of ethical consideration and how that might uh, relate to ethics. Um, just to elaborate a little bit on this, um, how does the public contrast with other organizations, um, other groups? So we'll see shortly um, that a lot of the disasters in this class, a lot of the uh, tragedies that we cover in this class are the result of uh, groups with interests that conflict with the safety of the public. And uh, the first uh, case of this are going to be cases of uh, interests within an organization that aren't primarily concerned with health, safety, and welfare of the public. And for the most part, those concerns tend to be financial concerns. In other words, uh, people with a financial interest at stake um, who, who want to make money, who don't want to lose money, um, and uh, those groups tend to take actions that might put the health, safety, and welfare of the public at risk. And so the question is, um, how do you 
decide uh, uh, how do you decide what to do? Oops, sorry. Uh, how do you decide what to do uh, when these groups have conflicting interests? Right, when the safety of the welfare of the public conflicts with, say, management or the business owners um, or the shareholders um, who have a financial stake in the engineering project and may not want to do what keeps the public safe. Right? Consumers, uh, customers might also have uh, interests that conflict with the general public. Uh, maybe competitors, uh, maybe uh, uh, organizing your business in a way that best uh, competes with your uh, uh, competitors um, also puts the health, safety, and welfare of the public at risk. Uh, maybe voters or different advocacy groups, interest groups of various kinds. Maybe politicians and government officials um, have interests that conflict with the interests of the public. All right. And um, a lot of these ethical challenges are going to be about what to do in cases where these interests conflict, right? how to manage uh, the conflicts that might arise. Um, especially with large engineering projects where there are many interests at stake, or um, with large engineering projects um, in large businesses, in large companies, um, where there are many interests at stake, um, settling these ethical challenges, settling these ethical conflicts uh, might be very non-trivial. Um, the news media, entertainment media, social media, right? these groups might also have interests that conflict with the health, safety, welfare of the public. So what do you do in these cases of conflict? Whose values should take priority? How do we, and should we, put the public's interests uh, over and above other interests from these other groups? So I've been talking about this very abstractly. Um, let's deal with a concrete case now. Uh, this is our first major engineering disaster. This is the Challenger explosion. Um, I'm actually going to go to the Wikipedia page, talk about Challenger a little bit. All right, so uh, Challenger... Uh, 1986, uh, January 28th, 1986. Uh, the Challenger is a space shuttle, goes up, uh, and 73 seconds after launch, it explodes, killing all astronauts on board. Um, all these astronauts uh, die in this launch, um, including uh, Krista McAuliffe, uh, which is her. Krista McAuliffe um, was not a career astronaut. Usually astronauts uh, become astronauts through the military in some way or other. But Krista McAuliffe was a teacher, who uh, was selected in a, con a national contest um, and then went through the astronaut training to become the first teacher in space. She was uh, going to give some lessons um, from the uh, space station. Um, uh, and because there was a teacher on the shuttle, um, every classroom in America had a TV on watching the launch. As it happened, that means um, just about every kid in America saw the uh, shuttle explode. I'll show you the video in just a few minutes. Um, but let me say uh, just a couple of things. Uh, so the uh, shuttle exploded partly because it launched uh, when it was very, very cold. It was below freezing the night before the launch. Um, and in fact, it had been cold all week. The launch was scheduled to go off on the 22nd, on January 22nd, but it didn't actually go off until the 28th, which is almost a week later. Um, and it had been delayed, postponed several times because it was cold. Um, here's just two hours before the launch. Uh, icicles hanging off the uh, launch pad, uh, hanging off the shuttle. Um, it was below freezing uh, uh, right before the launch. Um, the coldest launch they'd ever done before that was uh, 54 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was below freezing the night before they did uh, this launch. Um, it was way colder than they uh, had wanted to do the launch, and there were parts of the rockets that were known to fail in cold conditions, in particular these O-rings. So this is the famous discussion of the O-rings and the Challenger. Uh, there were a couple of O-rings um, on these rockets. The O-rings were meant to be seals uh, that uh, keep um, the flammable gases inside the rocket. And they had a couple of these O-rings, but the O-rings were known to fail uh, in extremely cold weather, um, and the engineers didn't want to launch. But they did launch anyway, um, and before, before I show you the video, let me just tell you a couple of the pressures uh, that uh, moved them to launch. So one uh, strong pressure on the launch was President Reagan uh, was scheduled to give his State of the Union address on the night of the 28th, the night when it exploded. 
Um, Reagan was expecting that the launch would be successful on the 22nd so that he would have a successful launch, launch to talk about during his State of the Union address. And as the delays kept piling up, the Reagan administration would put increasing pressure on NASA to get the launch successful so that he would have something to brag about during his State of the Union address. So there was this, this isn't financial pressure, this is political pressure, political pressure from the President of the United States to have a successful launch. And the NASA administrators were feeling this pressure, and this is part of what was pressuring them to go through with the launch um, that they knew was risky. Um, another factor that went into the decision to launch um, was the fact, uh, was the uh, rocket manufacturers. Uh, so NASA wasn't building their own rockets, they were contracting out to a uh, rocket manufacturer called, uh, named Morton Thiokol. Uh, Morton Thiokol uh, was a contractor for these rockets, and their contract was uh, due. They were actually in negotiations for renewing the contract, and a successful launch would have helped those negotiations go along uh, qu quite a bit. The delays in the launch were making the uh, contract negotiations more difficult. So this was a financial incentive, the financial incentive to get that uh, contract. Um, secure. Um, so these, this political pressure, this financial pressure, uh, led them to go through through with this launch, even though it was colder than they uh, wanted to. Um, I'll go ahead and show you a video of the launch. T-minus 21 seconds, and the solid uh, rocket booster engine gimbal now underway. T-minus 15 seconds. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. All right, so we have about 70 seconds until the shuttle explodes. Let me just say a, a couple more things. Um, uh, so there was a meeting the night before the shuttle launch where they talked with the engineers to decide whether to go through with the launch and this meeting was documented um, in fact everything that happened in the meeting was well documented um, after the explosion there was the Reagan commission uh, that investigated exactly what went wrong um, shell's about to explode engines at 65 percent three engines uh, running normally three good fuel cells three good APUs Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance 3 nautical miles. So the 25th Space Shuttle mission is now on the way after more delays than NASA cares to count. This morning it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. 1 minute 15 seconds. Velocity 2,900 feet per second. Altitude 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance 7 nautical miles. Looks like a couple of the uh, solid rocket boosters uh, blew away from the side of the shuttle in an explosion. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have no downlink. and stop that right there um good so uh yeah so every, so it was a national tragedy um reagan actually ended up postponing his state of the union address he ended up giving a memorial speech about the childhood explosion later that night um and then he postponed his state of the union address by a week um it was a national tragedy and um all the school children were affected by it um it was a it was a it was a big deal um and the problem again was the failure of these O-rings, um, these sort of rubber rings, these seals, um, that uh, had disintegrated because it was frozen the night before, and these rings were not uh, slated to operate in these conditions. <clears throat> um, and this was a preventable disaster. This was 
uh, this was a preventable disaster. We knew uh, that these O-rings were not um, reliable in this cold weather. Uh, and the issue with the O-rings failing was brought up explicitly at this meeting the night before the launch. Um, they had these meetings with uh, all the engineering uh, people and all the executives uh, from all over the place. Uh, this is the Thiokol NASA conference call the night before. And this was the meeting where um, they had postponed it uh, already for several days. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the issue was, were they going to postpone it again? Now, um, uh, before I go into what happened at the meeting, I'll say that before the meeting uh, occurred, um, actually a uh, year before the meeting occurred, one of the engineers um, involved with the rocket, Bob Ebling, maybe I should make this uh, a little bigger, uh, one of the engineers involved with the uh, launch, Bob Ebling, um, understood the risks of these O-rings uh, and had actually written a memo um, about... Uh, what happens when these O-rings are launched in low temperatures. Um, he was extremely worried about it. Um, he wrote this memo and told, to talked to everyone he could about this memo. Um, the memo was going around, and all the engineers knew about these risks um, at the time of this meeting. Um, but the night before the call, on January 27th, the Morton Thiokol engineers and managers all spoke with the NASA uh, people. Um, at this meeting, the engineers... Um, reiterated their concerns about the O-rings um, and about the temperatures uh, going into the launch. Um, one, uh, the management did not want to delay, um, and uh, one of the managers um, said that they were appalled by the recommendation to delay. Another manager said, my God, Thiokol, do you want me to launch? When do you want me to launch? Next April? Remember, this is in January. Um, the NASA heads, under this political pressure, thought that the engineering request to delay the launch was unnecessary and, uh, and, and unproven. And the reason they thought it was unproven was because they'd never actually tested the O-rings at temperatures as low as what they were encountering uh, on the day of the launch. They had tested te temperatures as low as freezing, but it was below freezing, and they'd never te tested temperatures that low. Now, you might think that if it's going to fail at freezing, it's going to fail if it's below freezing also, but this was enough wiggle room for the managers at the time to override the engineers' concerns. Um, and this takes place in this very dramatic discussion where the, um, so, um, the head of engineering is Bob Lund, uh, and, uh, uh, and there's a, a general VP of, uh, of Morton Thiokol and NASA, um, all at this meeting, and the VP of engineering is getting these messages from his engineers saying not, not to launch that is not safe, and so the VP of engineering says that he votes to postpone the launch on advice of his engineers. And the general manager turns to the VP of engineering and says, look, take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. And that's exactly what happened. He changed his hat and he changed his voice and 30 minutes later, um, he changed his recommendation from not to launch to launch. So I, lo I love the demonstration of this and it's a perfect example of the scope of ethical consideration Right, so when the VP of engineering is thinking like an engineer, right, when he's taking the advice of his engineers, the people who are actually working on this issue, um, when he's thinking like an engineer, he decides not to go through with the launch. But when he's told by his managing manager peers, right, by the other, by the other managers, by the general manager, when he's told by these people to think like a manager, then he changes his decision, and that changed decision ended up costing the lives of those astronauts and several million dollars of uh, equipment and the psychological trauma of all the children, school children and so on. Take off your management hat, or take off your engineering hat, put on your management hat. Right? This is a change in the scope of ethical consideration. It's a change in the values and perspectives that go into the decision. And when you change that hat, 
you change the decisions that you make. And those decisions can be life or death decisions in this case. So Challenger Disaster is a great example of how the scope of ethical consideration matters to the decisions we make. What values we're considering? Are we considering the engineering values more important than the management values? Are we considering the political pressure from the president and the financial interests of the contract renewal? Are these things more important than the health and safety of all the astronauts on board? Um, Uh, yeah, so it's a heavy thing. I have a lot of resources on Moodle for you to uh, dive into this. Um, I also have this video from the Rogers Commission. So they uh, assigned uh, Richard Feynman uh, to the Rogers Commission. Uh, the Rogers Commission was the commission that was investigating what went wrong and why. And Feynman was incredibly upset at NASA um, and at Morton Thiokol and at NASA especially for going through with this launch despite the recommendations of the engineers. It's extremely irresponsible. Uh, um, this is a great way to start the engineering ethics uh, case studies because this is not an engineering failure. In fact, the engineers did well. The engineers did everything they could to make the problem known and prevent the launch from happening. And the thing is that the engineering decision here was overridden by the managers. And the managers have different interests. They have a different perspective than the engineers. The engineers know the technical issue. The managers know the financial and the political issues. And... Uh, that difference can make a difference, right? So um, this is a good case to start off engineering ethics because the engineer, it makes the engineers look good, right? They tried their hardest and it was the management, the, the decisions from the higher ups that ended up uh, causing the tragedy. I will say though, while it makes the engineers look good, um, the actual engineers involved uh, didn't uh, Fair so well. So uh, Bob Ebling, um, so this was in 2016, in January 2016, on the 30-year anniversary. Um, NPR had this story where they interviewed Bob Ebling. Uh, here he is. Um, he's in his uh, 80s uh, here. Um, and the interview is kind of sad because he, he talks, he's sort of still depressed about the Challenger explosion, still blames himself. Um, he still feels like he could have done more. Uh, that, that he didn't do everything that he could. Um, he, he says, I should have done more. I could, I could have done more. I should have done more. And he still blames himself 30 years after the launch that it was his fault. Uh, even though, I mean, when you look at the Rogers Commission, when you look at the um, what actually happened, it looks very clearly like it was a management decision and not an engineering decision, that uh, the engineers did what they could, that they really did what they could, and the managers just didn't care what the engineers said. So Bob Ebeling, 30 years later, uh, still blamed himself, felt that he could have done more. He's still haunted by the Chandra explosion. And uh, just to put a little cap on this story, uh, so they uh, put this out in January of 2016 um, on the third year anniversary. And in response to this story, there was this huge outpouring of response from people uh, saying that, look, Bob, you didn't, do, you didn't do anything wrong. You did the best you could. Uh, it wasn't your fault thousands of people writing in saying that it wasn't his fault and uh, he died uh, just a few months later he died in March just a few months later that that year um, and it's one of these things you know where an old person they have some project that they're holding on to and they stay alive until that project's done and then once it's done they uh, his daughter says he it's as if he got permission from the world uh, he was able to let that part of his life go and then once that part of his life was sort of resolved he ended up passing away um, which is nice. It's nice that he passed away um, knowing that he was forgiven by the world, that it wasn't, uh, that the people still didn't, didn't blame him. Uh, I don't know about the rest of these managers, though, if they still <laughs> live with the guilt or, or what, but um, yeah, so uh, think about the Challenger disaster. It's an incredibly interesting case. There's a lot of uh, meat to dive into here. Um, think about the Challenger explosion in regards to the scope of ethical consideration and how changes in the scope uh, might change uh, how these decisions are made. The other big um, lesson in the required readings um, also having to do with the scope of ethical consideration um, is the issue of women in STEM, women in engineering. Um, NGIT uh, has a gender ratio of 
Uh, it's below the national average. Um, national average is 40 out of 60. And in uh, NGIT, it's 23 to 76. 23 to 76. Uh, is much below the national average of 40 to 60 student body. Um, Uh, ethnic diversity at NJIT is, is fairly good compared to the national averages. Um, we have a fairly diverse campus. Um, we have a lot of uh, minority students, a lot of uh, students uh, coming in from uh, other countries, a lot of students who don't have English as a first language. Right? Um, the diversity, uh, the ethnic diversity, um, the cultural diversity uh, on campus is very good. The gender diversity is quite poor, well below the national average. Um, and this is a problem for NJIT, but this is a problem for engineering generally. In fact, for all STEM fields, STEM is uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, in almost all STEM fields, um, there's a huge gender imbalance. Um, you would expect, uh, all things being equal, that there would be uh, as many men as uh, women in these fields, but in fact, and in, in many fields, the gender ratio is pretty even. And in fact, in the life sciences, in the social sciences, uh, the gender ratio is even or even balanced in favor of women. Um, but in the physical sciences and mathematics, you have uh, below 50% women. And in particular, in computer science and engineering, you have uh, incredibly low uh, f uh, women participation. Um, in some cases, below 20% um, in computer sciences. Um, these figures are actually a little bit out of date, and so I've included on the Moodle um, this uh, more recent report from the NSF. Um, this is a report uh, that was released at the, in January of this year, uh, 2017, on women, minorities, and persons with disabilities in science and engineering. And there's a lot of updated information. I think the information goes to 2014. Uh, and you can see uh, here's one of the key charts here. So this is, uh, so uh, actually first let me, oops, sorry. So in the biological sciences and social sciences, you see that uh, uh, female uh, women participation is uh, over 50% um, in biological sciences. Uh, bachelor's degrees are almost 60%. Um, but in engineering fields, uh, women, uh, participation of women is very low. So uh, only 19% of bachelor's degrees are awarded to women. Um, no, so uh, the way this chart works is that here on the right of this chart are the number of women in thousands. So you see that every year more and more women are joining these fields. Um, but on the left here, you see the, uh, the percentage of women um, in the field. So you see that, see that even though more women are earning bachelor's degrees in engineering, uh, there are fewer women as a percentage that are earning bachelor's degrees. So in 2004, it was 20%. And in 2014, it was 19%. So it went down a percent. Uh, in other words, uh, there are more women in engineering. There are more women, men in engineering also. And there's been a surge in engineering, uh, engineering degrees. But that surge has largely favored men and has put women in an even greater minority over the last decade. Um, and this trend uh, is not as bad in the higher... Um, for higher degrees, or 22% of doctorate degrees in engineering go to women. Um, so that's a greater percentage than a bachelor's degrees. Um, the really dismal uh, of these is computer science. Um, using computer science, uh, women uh, make up only 18% of the uh, degrees. And in fact, there's been a huge contraction of women in computer science degrees in just the last 10 years, uh, that fewer women are, in, are getting computer science degrees today than even just 10 years ago. Uh, fewer women, both total numbers and as a percentage. Uh, these numbers have declined for bachelor's degrees. Um, in fact, they've declined as a percentage um, for even the higher levels also, although more women are getting master's and doctorate degrees um, the percentage of women is also going down. Um, there's lots of interesting information in this study. Um, you can go through uh, this in a lot more detail. 
you can see that uh, for minorities in general, um, the trends have been uh, well, so uh, for minorities, sorry, underrepresented minorities in general, the trends have gone way up um, over the last twenty years. Um, especially for Hispanics, especially for Hispanics in engineering, uh, these trends have gone uh, uh, pretty high up. Um, uh, not so much for African Americans um, or Asians, it has stayed pretty constant over the last 20 years. Um, but there's been a big push for more Hispanic participation, and that's been successful. Uh, it's been successful, um, especially compared to women. So, women in engineering is the big um, issue here. Um, women are pushed out of engineering fields. And in fact, this isn't just in the degrees, but also in the occupation. So, um, women. Um, in engineers, so, uh, let me actually go back to degrees. So, 19% um, of engineering degrees are awarded to women. Uh, bachelor's degrees are awarded to women. 24% uh, of master's degrees are awarded to women. But um, the number of women in engineering is only 14%. Uh, only 14% of engineers are women. So, 19% of the degrees are awarded to women, 24% of the master's degrees are awarded to women, but only 14% of the engineers in the profession are women. So you even see a drop. So not only are there fewer women in getting the degrees, but there's fewer women who earn the degrees uh, are actually going into the field. Right? So you have the, uh, the sort of uh, loss of uh, women in engineering at each of these stages. And there are reasons for this. There are um, well-documented, well-studied reasons for this. Um, and I have on Moodle um, uh, quite a few uh, resources for you to uh, uh, dive into this in more detail. Um, in particular, I have this uh, report from um, the American Association uh, of University Women, AUW, um, where they, uh, the report's called Why So Few Women in STEM. This is from about a decade ago. Um, but they talk about reasons why women uh, don't go into um, uh, STEM fields. And it's important to note that um, in elementary school, uh, uh, boys and girls take the same number of math classes, and they also perform about as well. In fact, uh, girls perform slightly better than boys in uh, math classes in grade school. But after grade school, once you get into college, uh, there becomes this big divide, and women are much less likely to be uh, uh, engineers in college. Um, even though there's no performance difference in lower schools, there's these uh, huge uh, statistical differences in uh, college and in the engineering fields themselves. And why is this? Well, uh, there's lots of discussion of this. So, um, uh, and the the answer to this is that there's a strong culture uh, that uh, assumes that engineering uh, projects are best handled by men and not handled well by women. And this culture, this presumption um, in the culture and in the field itself, um, uh, uh, it treats women unfairly and it gives them uh, the short end of the stick in, in many cases. Um, uh, you see this not just in the percentage of women in these fields, but also in things like the uh, wage gap, that women earn 70 cents on the dollar uh, to men in the same field. Um, if you're going to earn 70 cents on the dollar, then you're not going to be as motivated to go into a competitive field like engineering. If there's a strong culture that doesn't give you the breaks and tends to give men breaks over you, then you're not as likely to want to go into that field because it's not... Uh, because it seems as if the field is not structured for you, is not uh, um, inclusive and inviting to you. Right? So again, this is an issue of the scope of ethical consideration. What is it that uh, happens in engineering fields, in STEM fields, that make women feel less uh, invited, included, accepted? Um, what is it that keeps it as a boys club and that keeps women from finding a place and from being um, encouraged to join? Right? You have um, we, we saw this just, just a second ago, that women, not only are uh, women not well represented, but they're being actively pushed out of these fields, especially in computer science. Right? There are fewer women today in computer science than there were just 10 years ago. Um, 
So there's a lot of great articles that I have. So I have this AAUW report, but then I have these um, articles, uh, academic articles, um, especially from uh, these uh, from Heather Stonier, um, where she talks about the problem of women in engineering, um, and she goes over uh, what it is about our cultural biases that assume that um, men are good engineers and women are bad engineers. Um, these things are not true. Um, this uh, performance gap. Um, d d there is no performance gap. Um, what there is is there's a, a culture gap. There's a, these assumptions about what engineering is and what it uh, ought to be. Um, and these assumptions uh, tend to be less encouraging of women in, in the field. Um, and so uh, Stanier uh, goes through this discussion about why the culture is the way it is and uh, the impact this has on women engineers. Um, this uh, article on the problem of engineering is taking, taking a sort of formal or theoretical approach to it. Uh, there's also this uh, second article from her, uh, uh, Making engineers, Engineering Students Making Women. Um, and this article actually is helpful because it has a lot of um, uh, quotes from women engineers talking about their experiences. Um, uh, as engineers, um, um, uh, yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of women engineers talking about how it doesn't feel like it's their place there, that the boys club, um, want, they want you to do it one way and that they're not very, uh, accepting or tolerant when you don't do it their way, um. Uh, and this makes uh, women engineers feel, uh, they're made to feel dumb, they're made to feel incompetent, uh, they're made to feel not um, capable of handling these projects. Um, again, these things are not true. Women are just as capable of being good engineers as men, but uh, the culture that doesn't encourage, uh, that uh, treats women as if they're not, good, uh, not going to be good engineers or scientists, um, this makes them feel not welcome and this pushes them out of the field. Right? It, anyone who is told that, or is made to feel like they're stupid and incompetent is not going to be very happy in that field. Um, and so this uh, leads to this massive pay gap. Um, there's lots of things to say about this. Um, please look through the literature that I've provided and uh, think about it carefully. Um, and think about what you want to say about it carefully. Um, one thing I want to talk about in relation to this, um, because I'm interested in psychology, and we're going to do a lot of psychology discussions later on, um, but uh, there's this effect called the stereotype, uh, stereotype threat. Um, this works uh, for gender. It also works for race and other kinds of identity categories. Um, and the stereotype threat, so it's this um, interesting psychological effect that happens when you, uh, you do what's called priming, when, when you make someone think about um, a negative stereotype that applies to them, um, it'll uh, hurt their performance. Um, and it works in the reverse. If you make someone think about a, stereotype, a positive stereotype that applies to them, it'll help their performance. Um, right, the, uh, the idea is that uh, just having them identify as something for which there's a negative stereotype can have a negative consequence. Right, so this is uh, um, SAT scores. Yeah, so these are SAT scores. Um, these are the performance of uh, black people in blue and white people in uh, green, green, I guess. Um, and uh, the difference here is when the stereotype threat is present and when, when there is no stereotype threat. So uh, the difference here is that when you have the people identify their race prior to taking the SAT, you don't have any, any difference in the test, any difference in the testing situation. The only difference here is that you ask them to identify their race. Well, um, there's a stereotype that black people are not as, uh, gonna perform as well in these standardized tests. And so just having them self-identify as black has this huge uh, dampening effect on performance. When you don't ask them to self-identify with race, there's uh, no change in performance. And notice that it also has an impact on uh, white students, right? Having white students self-identify as white, as white boosts their performance relative to the control. 
right? This works on race. It also works on gender. Um, here's the example in the uh, Prezi. Um, I believe these were math tests. Um, when you have uh, no stereotype threat, uh, when you don't have the students identify their gender, um, the girls do a little bit better than the boys. But when, when you have the students first self-identify their gender prior to taking the test, well, because there's a stereotype that girls are not as good at math than, as boys, then just having the girls say that they're girls, just write on top of their paper that they're female, and have the boys self-identifying as boys on top of their paper makes the boys do better and the girls do worse on these tests. Right? This is a psychological effect that these stereotypes um, have an impact on the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we perform. We perform worse when we're operating under the impression that we uh, conform to these uh, negative stereotypes. And we perform better when we operate under the impression that we conform to these positive stereotypes. Right, so these ways of thinking about ourselves and our abilities matter to our performance. Right? We do better when we think better about ourselves. We do worse when we think worse about ourselves. Right? And if there's a persistent cultural stereotype against girls in STEM fields, right, then girls uh, will tend to not perform as well and will tend to feel worse about their performance in these fields. And this is part of what pushes them out of these fields. Right, um, these assumptions are built into kids uh, v very early. Um, uh, right, so e so you know, little little kids. Um, you may not be able to see this. Right, um, boys' toys are uh, electronics, computers, uh, games, uh, this kind of stuff, and girls' toys tend to be household items. Right, this is preparing these these. Uh, children for gender roles later in life. Right? These things aren't uh, nat it's not that boys are naturally disposed to electronics and girls are naturally disposed to cooking. Uh, this is not true at all. This is an imposed and enforced um, protocol. This is a social um, this is a social pressure making the genders divide the labor in this way. Girls can do electronics just as well as boys but we don't treat boys and girls the same way, right? We enforce these kinds of divisions very early in life, and so it seems intuitive and natural when we get old. And uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's really bad <laughs> for everyone. Let me make sure this is clear. How to tell if a toy is for boys or girls? Do you operate that toy with your genitals? If yes, it's not a toy for children. If no, then it's a toy for either boys or girls. Um, the idea that we need to be telling boys and girls, be giving boys and girls different toys, have them play in different ways uh, to enforce these different stereotypes, it just makes things worse. Uh, it makes things worse for everyone. And uh, to enforce, to, to sort of drive that home, um, one of the readings I have uh, is uh, from Jonathan Zunger on Medium. Um, do, do, do. Uh, so Jonathan Zunger um, was a former senior Google uh, engineer. Um, he was at one point the lead developer for Google Plus, if you remember that. Um, he no, he just recently left Google, um, just a few weeks ago. But uh, uh, he left Google just after this manifesto went around from a Googler. You might have read about this in early August. There was this Google manifesto. Um, uh, one of the Googlers um, was upset about Google's anti uh, uh, was upset about Google's diversity policy. So Google has a diversity hiring policy where it tries to it makes a special effort to hire uh, women and minority candidates um, uh, from the pool um, in order to counteract some of these prejudices and biases that exist in STEM fields. So Google has a diversity policy. Uh, by the way, Google's diversity policy is not very good. Um, uh, they admit, Google itself admits that its diversity policy is not very good. 70% um, of Google employees are men, 60% are white. Um, only 3% are Hispanic and only 2% are African American. Right, um, this is way outside of the proportion of even Hispanics and African Americans who are earning degrees in engineering. 
right? Um, so they're not even taking a proportion of the qualified Hispanic and African uh, uh, African American candidates. So Google has a serious problem with diversity, but this Googler uh, thought that diversity policies already went too far, and he wrote this manifesto um, where the Googler. Uh, uh, goes into detail about why women are naturally disposed to not be good at engin engineering. That um, women, the argument is that women are better at social interactions, social relationships, um, and that uh, engineering is this kind of solitary, mathematical, sort of ra hardly rational, rational sort of uh, activity, and so um, women just won't make good engineers. And the Googler argues that this is. Um, uh, it's it's natural to women. It's also partly how we um, uh, raise women. But um, the Googler's point is that the fact that there's a gender gap in engineering fields is a product of uh, sort of uh, how men and women are different, and it's not a product of uh, any kind of uh, discrimination or uh, uh, prejudice. Um, so the Googler is totally wrong about this, and like I said, I have a bunch of resources in this lesson uh, going through exactly uh, what causes uh, these, uh, this, uh, the gender gap in engineering. Um, so the Googler is totally wrong about this, but uh, his manifesto got leaked and it caused this big uh, media storm, and a lot of people are talking about it, and Z Janusz Zunger is a Google senior engineer, and he gave a response um, where he talks about engineering in some detail. And I want to just read this quote. I put the quote on Moodle. Um, yeah, so Jonathan says, um, engineering is not the art of building devices. It's the art of fixing problems. Devices are a means, not an end. Fixing problems means first understanding them. And since the whole purpose of the things we do is to fix problems in the outside world. Problems involving people, that means... Uh, I'm sorry, I, let me start again. Engineering is not the art of building devices, it's the art of fixing problems. Devices are a means, not an end. Fixing problems means first, first of all understanding them. And since the whole purpose of the things we do is to fix problems in the outside world, problems involving people, that means that understanding people and the ways in which they will interact with your system is fundamental to every step of building a system. This is so key that we have a bunch of entire job ladders, uh, PMs and UXers and so on, who have done nothing but specialize in those problems. Um, let me skip ahead a little. Uh, and once you've understood a system and worked out what has to be built, do you retreat to a cave and start writing a code? Well, if you're a hobbyist, yes. But if you're a professional, especially one working on a system that can use terms like planet scale and carrier class without the slightest exaggeration, then you'll find quickly that the large bulk of your job is about coordinating and cooperating with other groups. It's about making sure you're all building one system instead of 20 different ones. It's about making sure that the dependencies and risks are managed, about, designs, about designing the right modularity boundaries that make it easy to continue to innovate in the future, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Essentially, engineering is all about cooperation, collaboration, and empathy for both your colleagues and your customers. If someone told you that engineering was a field where you could get away with not dealing with people or feelings, then I'm very sorry to tell you that you've been lied to. Solitary work is something that only happens at the most junior of levels, and even then it's only possible because someone senior to you, most likely your manager, has been putting in long hours to build up the social structure in your group that lets you focus on your code. So all those traits with the man which the manifesto described as female are the core traits which make someone a success which makes someone successful in engineering. Anyone can learn how to write code. Hell, by the time you reach it, by the time someone reaches L7 or so, it's expected that they've essentially mastered uh, the technique. The truly hard parts of the job are knowing which code to write and building a clear plan of what has to be done in order to achieve that goal, and building a consensus required to make it happen. And all of this is why the conclusions of this manifesto are precisely backwards. It's true that women are socialized to be better at paying attention to people's emotional needs and so on. This is something that makes them better engineers, not worse ones. It's a skill set that I didn't start out with and have had to learn through years upon years of grueling work. Uh, but, I learned, but I learned it because it's the heart of the job and because it turns out that it's where the most extraordinary challenges and worthwhile results happen.
I like this because it's, again, a reflection on the scope of ethical consideration, that it, engineering problems is not, engineering is not just about fixing, it's not just about building things, it's about fixing problems, and those problems involve people and the complex relationships that people get into, especially the relationships that people get into with your, with your engineering projects, with the things that you build. Right? Understanding how people relate to their objects is a core part of the engineering project. And that means that it's important to be able to see projects from lots of different sides. And this isn't, this isn't a female characteristic or a male characteristic. Um, this is something that's required for any complex project, any complex problem that's going to involve a lot of people, a lot of perspectives. Right, so thinking about engineering as for men or for women, is a, it's a mistake. Um, it's a mistake that uh, has no basis in the science. It's a mistake that um, makes the field a worse place for everyone. Uh, and it's really important for us to understand this. Um, I'm sure you've all thought about the gender gap at NGIT for one reason or another. Um, so think about it, think about this and talk about it on Moodle. Um, yeah. Uh, the last required reading I have um, is not a reading at all, but it's a video, and you can watch this video on uh, on the Moodle page. I have a link. The link's not in the Prezi, but it's in the Moodle because it's a private video, and the password is water. Um, so uh, uh, this is a commencement speech by David Foster Wallace. There are these two young yeah. fish swimming along. Um, I'll let you watch it. Uh, if you want. Um, David Foster Wallace's point here is about the importance of thinking, the importance of thinking, um, and the importance of controlling your thoughts. I just want to read this quote. He says, learning how to think really means learning how to exercise some control over how and what you think. It means being conscious and aware enough to choose what to pay attention to and to choose how to construct meaning from experience. Because if you cannot exercise this kind of choice in adult life, you will be totally hosed. Um, this is a commencement speech for a, a college graduation. Um, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Uh, I'll, I'll let you watch and read it. I think it mostly speaks for itself. I have another David Foster Wallace reading in the optional readings. Um, uh, I actually have two of these optional readings uh, apart from the anti-diversity memo. Um, um, that also deal with the scope of ethical consideration. Let me just touch on these briefly so you know what's, what's going on. Um, we started by thinking about the scope of the public and how it might differ from other interested parties like managers, um, consumers, and so on. Um, but maybe the public isn't the broadest possible scope. You might think that we can extend the scope even beyond the people Right, so the public is, are the people in society, right? the, um, the people who might use your, you know, drive over your bridge or whatever. Um, but maybe there are even larger scopes of consideration. So maybe first we can extend the scope of consideration beyond just the people, beyond just the public, but also to include the animals. Um, um, maybe the domestic animals that the people own, but maybe also the animals that are just wild uh, around the world. Uh, maybe those animals also deserve certain kinds of ethical consideration. Um, maybe... Uh, it's not right to do certain things to animals, um, even if it's in the interest and safety, if it's in the interest of the safety, health, and welfare of the public, right? So uh, maybe, so imagine a case where the, the, the public, there's some good that you can do to the public that'll help a lot of people, um, but it'll also, you know, drive a bunch of animals to extinction, kill, kill a bunch of animals, torture a bunch of animals. Uh, for, for example, uh, animal testing. Um, um, in order to make sure that products are safe for the public, um, we sometimes test them on animals. And sometimes that means that animals are subject to some cruel and unusual treatment. Um, and the goal is to keep the public safe. But that means treating animals poorly. Is this OK? Um, should those animals be considered uh, more in the scope of ethical consideration or, or not? Um, uh, you can think about how uh, these ethical discussions extend to the animals um, and how the interests of the animals might uh, compare or compete with the interests of the public. 
Um, one resource I have for considering this is the Consider the Lobster. is another David Foster Wallace piece um, where he goes to the main lobster festival and considers the fate of the lobsters there, which, you know, they're boiling alive and then eating, and they're doing it with you know, thousands and thousands of these lobsters, boiling them alive. He, can, he compares it to a Roman circus fest or a medieval torture fest. Um, he eats the lobster. In fact, he's a meat eater. He, he's not a vegetarian. Um, but seeing the sort of mass carnage of all these lobsters being slaughtered um, for the enjoyment of the public, right, makes him think of the Roman circus or a medieval torture fest. Um, Right? I mean, back in the day, uh, hanging or you know, drawing and quartering, that wasn't just to punish the person. It was a public spectacle. People would come out of their homes to watch it happen. It was the only entertainment they had, right? They didn't have TV, so they would come watch people being violently tortured and decapitated and so on. Um, <clears throat> and today we might think of that as, uh, as cruel or um, uncivilized. Um, but then we, we go and slaughter a bunch of animals and eat them, or you know, go to a, 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 a barbecue fest and see them slaughter a bunch of pigs and roast a bunch of pigs. I guess they don't slaughter them at the barbecue fest. But <clears throat> Anyway, uh, so in, in this article, he's thinking about the lobster. Um, and he's thinking about whether the lobsters feel pain and whether that matters to what consideration they give. And he has this quote. He's, he says, uh, My immediate reaction to such comparison is that it's hysterical or extreme. And yet the reason it seems extreme to me um, appears to be that I believe that animals are less morally important than human beings. And when it comes to defending such a belief, even to myself, I have to acknowledge that A, I have an obvious selfish interest in this belief, since I like to eat certain kinds of animals and I want to keep doing, I want to be able to keep doing it. And B, I have not succeeded in working out any sort of personal ethical system in which this belief is truly defensible instead of just selfishly convenient. And this is the dichotomy I want you to wrestle with in this reading, um, whether something is truly defensible or merely just selfishly convenient. Right? I like eating meat. Um, meat tastes good. Um, it brings me personal pleasure to eat like a good burger. But I also know that meat is, you know, it hurts the animals. Um, it also hurts the environment. Right? Um, eating uh, uh, beef. Uh, beef is incredibly environmentally uh, destructive. Um, the amount of energy, uh, the amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that go into producing a pound of beef uh, compared to even just a pound of turkey or a pound of uh, chicken or even better, a pound of vegetables. Um, the beef is, is an extreme, uh, uh, extremely wasteful uh, luxury, but I like it a lot. Is it defensible or do I just think that it's okay to eat meat because I like it? Is it merely selfish? Or am I just trying to indulge a personal interest? Or is it really the right thing to do? I mean, how do we distinguish between these two things? Uh, so that optional reading is about extending the scope of ethical consideration to the animals. We can also extend the scope of ethical consideration to the environment generally. Um, maybe the environment deserves consideration that that overrides the interests of the public. Right? Maybe the public's interests are very short-term interests. Right? I, you know, I want uh, something that's good for me and my family and you know, uh, my kids or whatever. Um, and maybe that's uh, interests over the span of 20 or 40 years. But maybe over the span of 100 or 1,000 years, we're causing massive ecological destruction. Um, so maybe the environment deserves more consideration Maybe the environment should be a paramount concern, even over above the safety, safety and interests of the public. Right, how do you adjudicate this? Um, Aldo Leopold writes this article he calls The Land Ethic, where he wants to extend the scope of ethical consideration to even the soil, even the rocks and the trees. I mean, even the rocks and the water. Uh, right? I mean, you, you might think, okay, we can extend the scope of ethical consideration to uh, the animals, um, uh, maybe we can extend the scope of ethical consideration uh, even to the plants, but Leopold wants to extend it to the soil, right, to the inanimate objects, to the climate system. Right? The climate system isn't alive, right? it, doesn't feel, it certainly doesn't feel pain, um, but maybe it deserves ethical consideration um, even still. Uh, Leopold argues that the history of ethics has been uh, broadening of the scope of ethical consideration, 
right? That we include more and more people into the, and more and more things into the scope of ethical consideration. And so Leopold just wants to go to the extreme and include everything in the scope of ethical consideration: the land ethic, right? The environmental, uh, environmentalist ethic. All right, I've said a lot. There's a lot of material here for you to discuss. Um, uh, please look it over. Uh, write an interesting post. Um, have a good discussion. Uh, and thank you very much. I'll see you uh, at the Hangout on Wednesday.